זוהי זכותו הטבעית של העם היהודי להיות כוחות עם ועם עומד ברשות עצמו The 5th of Iyar 5708, 14th of May 1948, David Ben-Gurion proclaims the State of Israel. The longest exile ever endured by a people was at an end, after almost 2,000 years of homelessness. The Jewish people came home. It's a story without parallel in history. The story of the love of a people for a land, the love of Jews for Israel. There in ancient times our people was born. And there in modern times our people was reborn. Join me in a journey of music and words as we think of what Israel meant to more than a hundred generations of our ancestors and what it means to us. I've chosen some music that moves me. I hope some of it speaks to you. Many of the words are in Ivrit and you'll find their translation in the accompanying booklet. And though the songs are varied, as the Jewish people is varied, one message runs through them all. Judaism was born in the hope of a land. And Israel is the Jewish land of hope. Jews returned from Babylon and rebuilt the temple, but they were conquered again by the Greeks. In the days of the Maccabees, they regained their independence, but it was short-lived, and they came under the rule of Rome. In year 66 of the Common Era, they rebelled, hoping to repeat the victory of the Maccabees, but they were defeated, and for a second time, the temple was destroyed. They rebelled again in the days of Bar Kokhba and were defeated again. So began the longest exile ever experienced by a people. For 1800 years, Jews were dispersed around the world, everywhere a minority, wandering from place to place in search of safety and a place to live. It was a history of terrible suffering, and it added new words to the lexicon of tragedy, expulsion, disputation forced conversion, inquisition, autodafé, ghetto, and pogrom. And though they kept faith, there were times when they cried out from the depths of despair, Elohim Shali, my God, where are you? This is a song written around that cry, sung by Gad Elbaz.
the Jewish people leave Israel voluntarily, and there were places they never left at all. Throughout the Middle Ages until modern times, when they could, they returned, as they'd returned from Egypt and from Babylon. Judah Halevi set sail to go there in 1140, though we don't know if he reached his destination. Maimonides and his family went there in 1165, though they were unable to stay in a land ravaged by the Crusaders. Nachmanides went in 1267 and revived the Jewish community in Jerusalem. In the 15th and 16th centuries, Jews came from Spain and Portugal. The community in Tzafat became a world center of Jewish scholarship and mysticism. And then in the 17th century, they came from the Ukraine after the massacres of 1648. In the 18th century, disciples of both the Baal Shem Tov and the Vilna Gaon made their way to the land. And in the 19th century, Aliyah became not a pilgrimage of the few, but a movement of the many. Jews never relinquished the dream of return. Wherever they were, they prayed about Israel and facing Israel. The Jewish people was the circumference of a circle at whose center was the Holy Land and Jerusalem the Holy City. For centuries, they lived suspended between memory and hope, 
sustained by the promise that one day God would bring them back. Here's a song whose words were written in Safat in the 16th century by the Jewish mystic Rabbi Eliezer Azikri. It's one of the most beautiful poems in Hebrew literature, a song of the love between Israel and God, Yedid Nefesh, beloved of the soul. In 1799, in the midst of his Middle East campaign, Napoleon called on Jews to return to their land. And during the 19th century, the great age of European nationalism, others began to think that way too. There were the religious Zionists, Rabbi Yehuda Alkali and Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Kalasher, who read the mood of the age and heard the call to Jews to re-establish themselves as a nation in their own land. There were Christian visionaries, statesmen like Lord Palmerston and Lord Shaftesbury, who felt likewise. In 1876, the Victorian writer George Eliot wrote one of the first Zionist novels, Daniel Deronda. Then, a disturbing new phenomenon began to appear. The European Enlightenment was supposed to end the prejudices of the past, but it didn't. A new and deadly prejudice was born. In 1879, it was given a name, anti-Semitism. And now a third voice began to be heard, from Judelev Pinska after the 1881 Russian pogroms, and Theodor Herzl after the Dreyfus trial in France in 1895, warning that Europe was becoming unsafe for Jews. So an ancient dream and a contemporary nightmare came together, calling Jews back to the land of their beginnings, just as the prophet Isaiah had said 27 centuries earlier. In that day, 
a great shofar will sound, and those who are perishing in exile will come and worship God on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Then came 1933 and the rise to power of Hitler and the Nazis. No one who had read or heard his words could doubt the danger. Anti-Semitism was at the heart of his campaign, and laws against Jews among the first of his acts. Gradually, inexorably, Jews were deprived of their rights, their jobs, their freedoms. They were spoken of as lice, vermin, a cancer in the body of the German nation that had to be surgically removed. A major humanitarian catastrophe was in the making, and everyone knew it. In July 1938, political leaders throughout the world gathered in the French town of Evian to discuss ways of saving the Jews. None was forthcoming. Nation after nation shut its doors. Millions of Jews were in danger, and there was nowhere they could go. On all the vast surface of the earth, there was not one inch Jews could call home, in the sense given by the poet Robert Frost, as the place where, when you have to go there, they have to let you in. The next piece of music is a poem written by one of the heroes of the 20th century, Hannah Senesh, a young woman from Hungary who made Aliyah in 1939. In 1943, she enlisted in the British Army, and in March 1944, she and two men were parachuted into Yugoslavia to help save the Jews of Hungary about to be deported to Auschwitz. When they landed, they discovered that the Germans had already invaded. The men called off the mission, but Hannah Senesh continued alone. She was arrested, tortured, and executed by the Germans. She was 23 years old. This was one of the poems she left behind. Kaylee, Kaylee, my God, my God, may these things never end. The sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of man. Kaylee.
as the smoke of war cleared in 1945, as the Russians entered Auschwitz and the British Bergen-Belsen, slowly people began to understand the enormity of what had happened. A third of world Jewry had gone up in flames. Entire worlds, the bustling Jewish townships of Eastern Europe, the Talmudic academies, the courts of the Jewish mystics, the Yiddish-speaking masses, the urbane Jews of Austria and Germany, the Jews of Poland who had lived among their Gentile neighbors for 800 years, the legendary synagogues and houses of study, all were erased. One and a half million children had been murdered, not just because of their faith or their parents' faith, but because one of their grandparents had been a Jew. When the destruction, the Shoah, was over, a pillar of cloud marked the place where Europe's Jews had once been, and a silence that consumed all words. Sholem Katz was a chazan who was taken to a concentration camp. He, along with 2,000 other Jews, was ordered to be shot. Before they did so, the Nazis made the men dig their own graves. As they stood there waiting for the end, Katz asked permission to sing Kael Mole Rachamin, the memorial prayer for the dead. They agreed. Katz sang so movingly that the Nazi officials kept him alive and he survived the war. Years later, he returned to the camp to sing the Kael Mole Rachamin for the six million Jews who did not survive. This is Sholem Katz singing that prayer. Even when the war was over, the Jewish situation remained tense. Refugee ships like the Exodus, carrying Holocaust survivors to mandatory Palestine, were turned back. There was violence in the land. 
the British mandatory power turned to the United Nations, and on the 29th of November 1947, the historic vote took place. By 33 votes to 13, with 10 abstentions, the decision was taken to partition the land between its Jewish and Arab populations. After almost 2,000 years, there would be once again a Jewish state in the land of the patriarchs and prophets. And on the 5th of year 5708, 14th of May 1948, the State of Israel was proclaimed. Was this the hand of God or the work of human beings? Surely it was both. And as we look back at the day the Jewish people became a sovereign nation again, the only adequate words are those of Hallel, that ancient set of psalms of thanksgiving for the miracles of Jewish history. Odecha ki anitani. I will thank you, for you answered me and became my salvation. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So many Jewish prayers have been answered. For the return to Zion, the ingathering of exiles, the restoration of Jewish sovereignty, and the rebuilding of the Jewish home. What so many generations dreamt of more in hope than expectation we have seen in our time. And yes, there were the centuries of tears, of hopes not met, dreams not realized, lives lost. Yet the Jewish people did survive. God's promise was fulfilled. The prayers of the ages have come true. So let's end this part of the story with joy, with those ancient words in which our ancestors expressed their faith that God was with them. Ki malachav yitzavelach, he will command his angels about you to guard you in all your ways. May the Lord God your going out and your return now and for all time.
When Jews began to rebuild their home in Israel, they had to do things they hadn't done for centuries. They had to cultivate land that had never been cultivated before, from the rocky hills of the Galil to the desert wastes of the Negev. On barren lands they made farms, in desolate landscapes they built villages. They had to integrate wave after wave of Olim, new arrivals from across the globe. They had to build a society and create the political and economic infrastructure of a nation. And in some ways the most remarkable of all, they made the decision to revive Hebrew, the language of the Bible, and turn it after more than 2,000 years into a living tongue again. The Chalutzim, the early pioneers, were visionaries. My great-grandfather, Rabbi Arya Leib Frumkin, was one of them. He was a rabbi from Lithuania who made Aliyah in 1871 and began writing his history of the sages of Jerusalem, chronicling the continuous Jewish presence there since the days of Nachmanides in 1267. In 1881, pogroms broke out in more than a hundred towns in Russia. That was when he realized that Aliyah was no longer a pilgrimage of the few, but an urgent necessity for the many. He became a pioneer, moving to one of the first agricultural settlements in the new Yeshuv. The early settlers had caught malaria and left. Rabbi Arya Leib led the return and built the first house there. The name they gave the town epitomizes their dreams. Using a phrase from the book of Hosea, they called it Petach Tikva, the gateway of hope. Today, it's the sixth largest city in Israel. One song, to me, sums up the hardship and the dreams of those early days. Naomi Shemer's Al Kol Eila. For all these things, the honey and the sting, the bitter and the sweet, grant your protection, dear God. Hashiveni va'ashuva el ha'aretz ha'tova. Bring me back and I will return to the good land. Al advash vi al avokes, al hamad hamatok, al bitenu hatinoket shmokeli ato, al haesh amev omeret, al hamayim hazakim, al haish hasham habaita min hamechakim, al kol al. Shmona <laughs> Shmokilia's <laughs> Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-
ארץ הטובה. מרשש אילם מרוח, מרחוק נושה כוכב, משלות ליבי בחושך נרשמות עכשיו. נא נשמו לי על כל אלה ועל ההווה נפשי, על השקט, על הבכי ועל זה השיר, על כל אלה, על כל הלילה, שמור על מי כלי הטוב, על הדבש ועל למוקץ. על המה והמתוק, על נתן They came to Israel from so many lands. In the early days, they came from Eastern Europe and Yemen. Then came the Holocaust survivors. Then, in the first years of the state, they came from other Arab lands. Operation Magic Carpet brought the Jews from Yemen on eagles' wings, as they said when they saw planes for the first time. Operation Ezra and Nehemiah brought the Jews of Iraq. They came from Turkey, Iran, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. Later, when the Soviet Union opened its doors, they came from Russia. They came from more than a hundred countries, speaking more than eighty languages. More than three thousand years earlier, Moses had prophesied, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. And so it was. A dismembered people, torn into a hundred fragments and scattered across the world, came together again as a living nation. There's nothing like it in all the annals of history. Here is the Sheba Choir, together with Shlomo Gronech, telling the story of their journey from Ethiopia.
and there was war. The new Yeshuv was never really accepted by its neighbors. The day the State of Israel was proclaimed, it was attacked by the armies of five states, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. A country of a mere 600,000 people, many of whom were Holocaust survivors, faced the full force of nations whose population was 45 million. And from that day to this, Israel was never far from war or the threat of war, terror or the threat of terror. In 1967, Arab armies gathered in force on Israel's borders. The Egyptian president, Abdul Nasser, closed the Straits of Tehran and spoke of driving Israel into the sea. For those of us watching these events from afar, it seemed as if a second Holocaust was in the making. It was a moment of trauma that changed my life, as it did for many Jews who lived through those days. As we know in retrospect, Israel survived and won an astonishing victory. The Six-Day War, as it came to be known, is associated indelibly with a song written just before, Naomi Shemer's Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. Shit, this 
Though Israel has had to fight many wars, from the very beginning it sought peace. From the time of the Balfour Declaration in 1917, it was recognized that the land, small though it was, had to be divided, so that Jewish and Arab inhabitants could each have a home. Jews accepted every partition proposal, from the Peel Commission in 1937 to the United Nations Resolution in 1947, for the sake of peace. In the Declaration of Independence, David Ben-Gurion called for peace. In 1967, after the Six-Day War, Israel again proposed negotiations to establish peace, but no peace came. To this day, only two of Israel's neighbors have made peace, Egypt in 1979 and Jordan in 1994. The Hebrew language has two words for strength, koach and gvurah. Koach is the strength you need to win a war. Gvura is the courage you need to make peace. Israel has shown both kinds of strength. But peace is a duet, not a solo. It can't be made by one side alone. If it could, it would have been made long ago. Seek peace and pursue it, says the psalm. The prophets of Israel were the first in history to see peace as an ideal. So, for the sake of Israel, for the sake of the Palestinians, for the sake of God and humanity in the future, we pray for peace. With God's help, Bezrat Hashem, Inshallah.
Beginning in 1993, the search for peace took on a new dimension with an initiative backed by the international community. In September of that year, Israeli and Palestinian leaders met and shook hands on the White House lawn, and Yitzhak Rabin gave one of the great speeches of the 20th century. We have come from Jerusalem, the ancient and eternal capital of the Jewish people. We have come from an anguished and grieving land. We have, we have come, come from, from a people, a home, a family that has not known a single year, not a single month, in which mothers have not wept for their sons. We have come to try and put an end to the hostilities, so that our children, our children's children, will no longer experience the painful cost of war, violence and terror. We have come to secure their lives, and to ease the sorrow and the painful memories of the past, to hope and pray for peace. Let me say to you, the Palestinians, we are destined to live together on the same soil, in the same land. We, the soldiers who return from battle, stained with blood. We who have seen our relatives and friends killed before our eyes, we who have attended their funerals and cannot look into the eyes of their parents. We who have come from a land where parents bury their children. We who have fought against you, the Palestinians. We say to you today in a loud and clear voice, enough of blood and tears, enough. We have no desire for revenge, we harbor no hatred towards you. We, like you, are people, people who want to build a home, to plant a tree, to love, to live side by side with you in dignity, in empathy, as human beings, as free men. We are today giving peace a chance and saying again to you, enough. Let us pray that a day will come when we will all say farewell to the arms. Our inner strength, our high moral values, have been derived for thousands of years from the Book of Books, in one of which, Koheleth, we read, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, the time for peace has come. It was not to be. In 1994, suicide bombings began. In 1995, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. In 2000, the peace process broke down, and there was a wave of terror and suicide bombings. In April 2002, on the first night of Pesach, as people gathered to begin the Seder, a suicide bomber struck in the Park Hotel in Netanya, killing 29 and injuring hundreds of others. This song, written by Stephen Levy, sung by Shimon Kramer, was composed in memory of that tragedy. Its words are taken from the Pesach Seder service, Vihisha Omda, the passage in which we remember that it was not one alone, Pharaoh, who tried to destroy the Jewish people, but in every generation. Sadly, too, in ours.
אני רואה שקיעה יפה של שמש מהירה כשהעולם עטוף שתיקה מזמין את הדממה מביא איתו את החלום ואל הלב שלי תקווה ולי נותר רק לחכות להגשמה זה הזמן שלי לברוח אל עולם של ילדים זה הזמן שלי לעוף איתם מלחפש מילים הרצון שלי לחבור כאן עולם מלא צבעים יהיה בודה ישיב אליי את החיים היו בי עוד אורות בשלל גבלים והם קבעו פניי היום פתרו רק אוכבים כי בלילות ליבי נפתח לחיות את החלום וילד אז בי נכנס עוד השלום constant threat of violence and war. That takes faith. Israel is the people that has always been sustained by faith, faith in God, in the future, in life itself. And though Israel is a secular state, its very existence is testimony to faith, the faith of a hundred generations that Jews would return, the faith that led pioneers to rebuild a land against seemingly impossible odds, the faith that after the Holocaust the Jewish people could live again, the faith that in the face of death continues to say, choose life. One classic expression of Jewish faith is Psalm 121, Esa Enai El Heharim, I lift my eyes to the hills, may Ayin Yavo Ezri, from where will my help come? This is Shai Gabso, 
singing a poignant song whose chorus is woven out of those words. במישול ההווה, כילד ההולך לו לאיבוד, כפות ידיים מושטות מבקשות את העזרה להמשיך איתך את המסע. ובצדדים הפרחים כאילו איבדו את זהותם מחפשים עוד קרן אור שתעזור עוד לגימה קטנה של מים ממעייני החוכמה תביא להם את התקווה ארים ראשי אשא עיניי אל הערים במרחקים וקולי היא שמעה כזעקה, כתפילת האדם, וליבי יקרא, מאין יבוא עזרי. עובר אני כעת בנופים חדשים, הצעדים הם נעשים כה איטיים, מה יש שם שאין פה? שאל אותי עובר, מה בלב אתה שומר? קשיש העיר כשעל גבו מונח כל עברו, מביט סביב ומחפש את עולמו. כשההווה כל כך קשה, לא אומר דבר. ארים ראשי אל המחר. ארים ראשי, אשא עיניי אל הערים במרחקים, וקולי יישמע כזעקה, כתפילת האדם, וליבי יקרא. מאין יבוא עזרי Thank you. 
forget upon the mountain of our shade, and then we'll cry no more. Yet we shall argue. Without reason, please, no more Weapons of destruction, terror and corruption, please, no more Oh, now the time has come Return and stay this time forever And let His glory shine The journey is not yet over. Israel has not yet found peace. Still, Jews find it hard to live their faith without fear. Judaism is twice as old as Christianity, three times as old as Islam. Yet there are 82 Christian nations, 56 Muslim ones, but only one Jewish state. A country smaller than the Kruger National Park, less than one quarter of one percent of the landmass of the Arab world. Israel is the only place on earth where in 4,000 years of history Jews have formed a majority. The only place where they've been able to rule themselves and defend themselves. The only place where they've been able to do what almost every other people takes for granted live as a nation shaping its own destiny and create a society according to its own values. Only in Israel can a Jew speak the Jewish language, see a Jewish landscape, live by the Jewish calendar, walk where our ancestors walked and continue the story they began. Yet still, it has to fight for the right to be. So often, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians is portrayed as a zero-sum game in which one side wins and the other loses. But it isn't so. From violence, both sides lose. From peace, both sides gain. What matters, therefore, is that we work for peace. A peace that will allow Israel and the Palestinians each to live in dignity and freedom without fear. A peace in which each makes space for the other. A peace in which the children of Abraham, Jews, Christians and Muslims, live together as brothers and sisters, part of the same extended family. A peace that heals the wounds of the past for the sake of generations not yet born. 
Ose Shalom Bimromav. May he who makes peace in his high places help us make peace on earth. Ose Shalom Bimromav. Ose Shalom, Shalom Aleinu Ve'al Kol Yisrael. So many people risked their lives for the sake of Israel. From those who made the hazardous journey in the Middle Ages to the pioneers of the new Yishuv. From those who fought in Israel's wars or served in its security forces to the people in the streets of Tel Aviv, the buses of Haifa and the cafes of Jerusalem at times when suicide bombings were taking place almost daily and everyday life was etched with fear. Many too many gave their lives. Why? Why, after everything, is it still so hard for the nations of the world to grant the Jewish people a place to live without fear? Israel is the West's oldest nation. Its religion is the West's oldest faith. Without Abraham, there would be no Christianity or Islam, two religions that between them command the allegiance of more than half of the six billion people alive today. Why must the people who first taught the world the sanctity of life so often be made to walk through the valley of the shadow of death? How many lives must be lost, how many tears must be shed, before humanity learns that bloodshed achieves nothing, that hate harms both the hated and the one who hates, that God's way is the way of peace. Here is a song from the depths of grief in the memory of those who died, dedicated to those who have been bereaved. Keshehalev Boche, when the heart weeps, only God hears. Give me strength, my God, help me not to be afraid. Asei sheyigamer, make it end. Kilo notabi koach, 
for I have no strength left. אדם נופל לפני שהוא שוקע בתפילה קטנה חותכת הדממה שמע ישראל אלוקיי אתה כל יכול נתת לי את חיי נתת לי הכל חזק אותי אלוקיי, עשה אשר אוהבך. הכאב גדול ואין לאן לברוח. עשה שייגמר כי לא נותר בי כוח. כשהלב בוכה, רק אלוקים שומע. הכאב עולה מתוך הנשמה. אדם נופל לפני שהוא שוקע. בתפילה קטנה חותכת הדממה. שמע ישראל אלוקיי, אתה כל יכול. נתת לי את חיי, נתת לי הכל. בעיניי דמעה, הלב בוכה בשקט. וכשהלב שותק, הנשמה זועקת. שמע עכשיו אני לבד, חזק אותי אלוקיי, עשה של אוהבך. הכאב גדול ואין לאן לברוח, עשה שייגמר 
כי לא נותר בי כוח. כשהלב בוכה, הזמן עומד מלכת. האדם רואה את כל חייו פתאום. אל הלא נודע, הוא לא רוצה ללכת. The first reference to Israel outside the Hebrew Bible is on the Menepta Stele, a slab of black granite engraved in the days of Pharaoh Menepta, successor to Ramses II, the man some scholars identify as the Pharaoh of the Exodus. It says, Israel is laid waste, her seed is no more. The first reference to Israel outside the Bible is an obituary. Israel's enemies thought it was dead. More than 32 centuries, half the history of civilization later, we can still say, Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people lives. Not only Jews, but people like Blaise Pascal, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Leo Tolstoy saw in this survival something miraculous, as if an invisible hand had written out of the lives of Jews across the generations a story about human possibility, about a journey from slavery to freedom across a great wilderness of space and time to a land of promise and hope. How did a people survive for 20 centuries without a state, a home, a place where they could defend themselves? How did they sustain their identity when everywhere they were a minority? How did faith survive the massacres and pogroms when Jews called and heaven seemed silent? That's what astonished Pascal Rousseau and Tolstoy before the 20th century. But today, the question is so much deeper. How could a people ravaged by the Holocaust survive that trauma and put their faith in life again? How could a nation that had not known independence or sovereignty for 2,000 years take it up again? How could they with so little 
build a land, a state, a society, a culture that has achieved so much. How, under constant threat of war and terror, surrounded by enemies pledged to their destruction, could they sustain a free and democratic society in a part of the world that had never known it? Create an economy with outstanding achievements in agriculture, science, medicine and technology. Produce a culture rich in art and music, poetry and prose. How, out of the most diverse population, could they shape an identity? How could they build not only great secular universities, but also thriving yeshivot, so that the words of Isaiah could come true in our time? The Kimitzion Tetzet Torah Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim. Torah will come forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. How, so soon after the nightmare, could they realize so many dreams? Somehow, in ways I don't fully understand, the Jewish people has been touched by a power greater than ourselves that's led our ancestors and contemporaries time and again to defy the normal parameters of history. Somehow, heaven and earth met in the Jewish heart, lifting people to do what otherwise seemed impossible. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. The Jewish axiom is different. Anim Amin, I believe, therefore I am. One of the great songs of modern times, written for the film Prince of Egypt, says it in words that summarize the whole history of Israel, from ancient times to today. There can be miracles when you believe. Yeah. 
it was the most haunting of all prophetic visions. The prophet Ezekiel saw a valley of dry bones, a heap of skeletons. God asked him, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel replied, God, you alone know. Then the bones came together and grew flesh and skin and began to breathe and live again. Then God said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Of Dad Tikvatenu our hope is lost. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what God says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. It was this passage that Naftali Hertz Imber was alluding to in 1877 when he wrote in the song that became Israel's national anthem, Hatikva, the phrase Od Lo of Da Tikvatenu, our hope is not yet lost. Little could he have known that 70 years later, one third of the Jewish people would have become in Auschwitz and Treblinka and Bergen-Belsen a valley of dry bones. Who could have been blamed for saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost. And yet, a mere three years after standing eyeball to eyeball with the angel of death, the Jewish people, by proclaiming the state of Israel, made a momentous affirmation of life, as if it had heard across the centuries the echo of God's words to Ezekiel, the Hevet Yedchem, El Admat Yisrael, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And a day will one day come when the story of Israel in modern times will speak not just to Jews, but to all who believe in the power of the human spirit as it reaches out to God as an everlasting symbol of the victory of life over death, hope over despair. Israel has taken a barren land and made it bloom again. It's taken an ancient language, the Hebrew of the Bible, and made it speak again. It's taken the West's oldest faith and made it young again. It's taken a tattered, shattered nation and made it live again. Israel is the country whose national anthem, Hatikva, means hope. Israel is the home of hope. Oh, uh -huh.